Uh, as, as she said, I'm Griff Green, and I want to talk about how we would build a commons today. I have lots of introductory, introductory talks about common stack, but I'm going to try to take it to like a little bit more of a, like in real life, how will this work eventually? And, uh, but to give some background, like we got to ask, like, is our economy doing a good job? Like, is it, is it getting the job done? And I think for in a lot of ways it is, right? And what is the job of our economy? What is the whole point? What is an economy? I, I could give a whole talk on what is an Well, I probably shouldn't be the one giving the talk on what is an economy, but that is a really deep question. And economies do a lot of things. And so the three things that I'm looking at specifically is, is it distributing resources fairly? You know, like, uh, and, and this is one of the values of having an economy. It's, it's a medium for exchanging resources. It's a, it's a way to reward people who create value. And it's also a way to incentivize behavior that we want to see in our communities. And I would say that the economy does, uh, that we have right now does okay at all of these things in some ways. And in some ways it really sucks. Like uh, in obvious ways that I'm sure you can imagine, it's, it has some holes. And the biggest hole in the economy is, uh, non is, is filled by nonprofits. So we live in a market economy, as in if you want to buy something as a customer, then you can find it. You know, we have incredibly complex uh, uh, resource streams around creating a cell phone in your pocket. Oh, can you mute your... Uh... Yeah. Uh, and and that's that's really nice, you know. Uh, if you as an individual want something, you can become a customer in the market economy, and a for-profit company will satisfy your every wish and desire. Because the market economy is really good at distributing scarce resources that are excludable, and that's the key. If you have something that you can exclude others from enjoying, like a movie theater then you can create a business model, right? You have to buy a ticket to go see the movie. And so now you can have a regenerative value creation. You can have a business model that uh, rewards the people who are creating value. Nonprofits get screwed. This is just the sad thing. In our market economy, that, the value creation that nonprofits uh, have, because this is something that I actually always have trouble getting people to understand. And I, I, I think that most of the people in this room know it because uh, I know a lot of the people in this room and I've talked to them about it before and, and they just understand that nonprofits create value. They are providing a service to our community. That's why people donate to them because they like the value that they're creating. The problem is this value is non-excludable. They're taking care of forests. They're taking care of the homeless. They're uh, built right, they're giving away products and services to the community as a large, at large. So communities can win, right? The problem is they don't have customers. They, their customer is this uh, like amorphous blob of society. And therefore they suffer from a tragedy commons issue, specifically the free rider problem. And, and there's, it's really difficult for nonprofits to create a business model. That's why they're nonprofits. And it's the real distinction here is that they are creating value, it's just the value is accessible to everyone. And this is where the stomp common stack comes in. We want to create sustainable funding, incentive alignment, and novel coordination techniques for supporting the production of public goods. Public goods are non-excludable by definition. And so I just use the term public goods as basically anything a nonprofit or a government service provides. To do this, we hope to build a foundation of tooling and documentation to allow innovative communities to design their own economy around the value they wanna create. In the end, this will never work if it's a top-down hierarchical, we'll tell you how to solve your problems like thing. That, that just doesn't work. People need to build their own systems so that, that uh, solve the problems that they see on the ground. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna create a system of training and tooling where people can come in 
and figure out, just like Will Ruddick did with grassroots economics, create these MOOCs and these, these systems, get them in place so people can come in and apply these tools where they want to. And, and this, is, this is what our system really allows, is a third way, a new way for society to, to solve uh, excludable, to provide excludable goods, to provide public goods. There's generally two ways, a government or a nonprofit. And we're building a third solution. And because we live in this, uh, like the market economy has, is really so big that we call it the economy, like it's the only one, uh, which is not true, but that's, that's basically how we see the world is through the market economic lens. Uh, because business models for public goods don't work, we create economic models to incentivize the, incentivize the production of the value that communities actually need. And we're, we're not just creating this, we're not making this up. This is something that uh, cryptocurrencies have brought to the forefront of society. Blockchains are basically computing power commons and they've solved the tragedy of the commons by creating an economic system uh, for, for uh, I'm starting to read the comments, oh no. Okay, uh, uh, they've created an economic system that rewards people who contribute to the commons and uh, in that way, using generally inflation, they can incentivize continued production. So my favorite example, I don't know, I, I, I have two favorite examples, PrimeCoin and CureCoin. I think CureCoin is probably more, uh, more, more um, like, relatable. yeah, relatable today. Because CureCoin is, uh, uh, they've turned the proof of work of their blockchain to point at this product called Folding at Home. Folding at home was something that you would run on your computer altruistically. So if, if you wanted to contribute spare resources as a donation to uh, researchers in Stanford, they could basically use your computing power to fold proteins for cancer research and Alzheimer's research. And I believe they're even using it now for COVID-19 research. Yeah. And now, uh, but then in 2014, a more than a decade after Folding at Home was created, CureCoin was created, making it making folding at home the proof of work for their blockchain to just kind of simplify their solution. And ever since then, CureCoin has been no, the number one contributor to folding at home uh, ever since its launch. And that's because people are doing the same work, but they're rewarded with the inflation of the currency. So if you have the choice to donate your computing power and get nothing, or uh, donate your computing power and receive a scarce resource that is still just imaginary, magical internet money, right? Then you're going to choose to run CureCoin if you can. And what's really cool about CureCoin is Monero miners who don't even know what CureCoin does. When CureCoin's price go up, goes up, they will actually turn off their Monero miner or, and point, start pointing their computing resources at CureCoin and start folding proteins for COVID-19 research just because they will make money. They don't even know that they're helping, to, to, they're helping researchers uh, all around the world uh, deal with this crisis. And they don't care. They're just in it for the money. And that's, that's incredible. Turning something altruistic into something that you can uh, profit off of is something that I think ha is generally the killer app of blockchain tech. And our goal at the common stack is to make it work for anything. As I said here, this is computing power, right? So uh, let me turn off my telegram because it will keep popping up. That's just computing power. But this, this is actually uh, everything. Right? We want to make it like nonprofits do a lot more outside in the physical space than in the digital space. So, uh, I'm going to talk about how we could use common stack tools and technology to create, to support the COVID-19 crisis. So let's just start with where we are, right? We have a public health economy already. There are donors and taxpayers and their money is, well, and sometimes money is just created. I should put the Federal Reserve there too or something, but uh, we have money coming in 
And then decision makers decide what to do with those pool of funds. And then they use those funds to help the public health, uh, com uh, to fund projects in public health. So that's great, but what, how do the decision makers know what the right choice is? How do they decide between different options? Uh, do they, ha they don't have very good feedback mechanisms on if they made a good choice or a bad choice. In fact, they're not incentivized to make good choices. If a, if a bureaucrat in the government says uh, they want to you know, do something really great with the money, they just solve, they solve the whole COVID crisis with this one good decision, they receive their paycheck. They receive the same paycheck that they receive just in the same situation where they decide to just blow the money on hookers and blow and you know they, they still receive their paycheck. And that's, that's clearly not the right incentive structure to bring good decisions to the, to the table. So what we do is we create, we can create a parallel public health crypto economy. And we do this by doing exactly what Will does. We're creating in a way a local currency that can pool funds uh, for public health. And so uh, this becomes a circular economy that will allow us to measure the inputs and outputs like Will said in the, in the question and answer section, it, we can be way better regulated than any government agency because every transaction is completely transparent and not only better regulated, but better managed because if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. And here we can measure all the inputs, all the outputs, and even add results to it. And so now what's really interesting is that we can turn the donors and the taxpayers and the decision makers into token holders. And we can make sure that the people who are making decisions have skin in the game. Uh, now, we do this using bonding curves. And I'm going to kind of uh, take a pause on the, on the, you know, let's create a commons conversation and really talk about what the hell is a bonding curve. Because I know bonding curves, they're complicated, blah, 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 but they're so magical. This is the second price discovery mechanism we have, we have in, ever discovered. I mean, this is such an economic primitive, like such a core economic primitive that solves so many problems. Uh, in, a, in the, our current market economy, in the current two-sided markets, price is completely free-floating. Floating. If And to, to um, exasperate, Look at what happened a couple Thursdays ago on what we were calling Black Thursday, where the crypto market just tanked. Honestly, not that many people sold. So yeah, for sure, some people sold. But the real problem was that no one was buying. It, no one wanted to buy Bitcoin in that moment. And if you have a two-sided market and it's not very liquid, there's not a lot of market participants, and you have one person who wants to sell, but no one who wants to buy. You have no buyers. No one wants to buy anymore. But there's someone who wants to sell. Well, they will keep lowering their selling price until they get something. And the price can literally just free fall. And, and this, is, this is why the SEC exists. They say, listen, you cannot create a publicly traded asset unless you have a liquid market. Unless we believe that there will be enough buyers and sellers to prevent this complete freefall that will happen or an extreme rise that can happen if there's not enough buyers and sellers. And so two-sided markets work great if you're a giant organization or if you have a, a lot of buyers and sellers. And as well, they're also really simple and well understood because we've been using them for, that, I don't know, at least hundreds of years. A bonding curve though, solves this problem for especially illiquid markets, uh, as in markets that don't have a lot of market participants, because the price is algorithmic. The, pr the way a bonding curve works is, well, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show one at, after this slide, uh, but basically you get to set the price of every token in advance. You don't know what the price of the token will be in time, right? That's of course unknown. That's dependent on buying and selling. But you do know that the thousandth token created will be created at a specific price. And uh, 
what that does is it allows this, um, it allows, it creates kind of a buyer of last resort. If, if Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies were, at a bond, were on a bonding curve, you wouldn't have seen that free fall on Black Thursday. A lot of people would have to sell. We wouldn't need buyers. There would, the bonding curve can act as the buyer every time. And I think that uh, what's really important about bonding curves and the most, the most important thing and most important use of it is that you can use it for small markets. And so we're going to create a bonding curve. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm going to zoom in here. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. Okay, so this is a bonding curve. It's kind of just a random bonding curve. You see, you can create any bonding curve. You can create any kind of bonding curve you want. So let's just say, like, we'll do a bonding curve that's like uh, this to the one half power. We get a nice, nice curve there. You know, it's cool. Every token that is created, when someone creates the 20th token, the price is always going to be 4.47 cents, right? And when I say create, that's basically buying. Because in a bonding curve, and I forgot to say this before, in a bonding curve, when you buy a token, you can buy it from someone else, or you can buy it directly from the bonding curve. And when you buy it, that token is created. It didn't exist before. And so the to the, in, in a two-sided market, you have a set number of, let's say, Amazon shares. In a bonding curve, the bonding curve creates and destroys tokens on demand based off of the, the predetermined uh, token prices. So what's really cool is you can do anything. You can do anything uh, with this bonding curve. You can, you can maybe, let's make a little valley. Let's just say that this is actually uh, uh, three and this is 2.5. And we'll have like a little bit of a valley there. Why not? We'll see what happens, right? It could be fun. Uh, maybe it'll make people get stuck there. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. But this is, this is what's really cool with a bonding curve is that you can do with it whatever you want. You can determine how the market will react to supply and demand in advance. Okay. So that's our little bonding curve aside. Let's close that and we're back. Okay, we're going back to our scheduled programming, which is the Salute Commons. So we're talking about creating a commons for public health. This commons is a, a token, basically a bonding curve that wraps two pools of funds. So in a normal, uh, in the normal public health space, there is just the funding pool. This is the funding pool is the money that the public health like decision makers use to like get stuff done, right? And this is what actually creates value. This is uh, the, and then the so the and that's the most important part. The funding pool is the engine of the commons. It is where value production is incentivized. The reserve is what we add. The reserve is part of the bonding curve. This is where the money is stored. When tokens are created, money goes to the reserve and, and tokens are emitted based off of the, the rules of the bonding curve. And the reserve is this collateral that is released when salute tokens are sent to the bonding curve and, uh, and is stored when salute tokens are created. So the reserve is what gives the token obvious value. Just like in Will's, uh, in grassroots economics and, and the local, the CIC currencies, they have a reserve, but they don't have a funding pool. So that we're taking what Will did with grassroots economics and, uh, and including uh, normal government bureaucracy and hoping that we make some magic. So the, the real question is when you're designing these commons is, what is the relationship between the reserve and the funding pool? And this is such a complex question, and it has so many, uh, so many interesting uh, details that are important that it, we believe that it's, it's almost irresponsible to 
deploy one of these things without using some kind of simulation software such as CAD CAD. And, and that's why we are very connected with CAD CAD. So uh, let's just look at how the economy would work once it's running. Uh, if the Salute Commons is managed well, it'll correct, cor attract more donations, right? If people are uh, doing good work with the funding pool, then other people will be like, oh man, yeah, there's a health crisis right now. I wanna support it. I believe in, in the Salute Commons ability to uh, address these issues, I'm gonna donate. But what's interesting here is it's not really donating. It's, it's pretty much impact investing. So they will send their euros to the, to the Salute Commons and they will end up getting tokens in return worth the exact same amount. And that's the crazy thing. They're donating, and, but, it, but it's really almost like an ICO or a stock purchase, an IPO, where uh, they are getting new tokens created for them. And whenever someone, uh, whenever the internal economy of the Salute Commons grows, then, then uh, the price will go up. This is a very simple uh, thing that we do, and it doesn't have to be this way. This is the magic of bonding curves. But the simplest thing is when the Salute Common grows in size, Salute Commons grows in size, the price of the token will go up. And this is where the augmented bonding curve comes in. So the, when people want to sell their tokens, uh, the price will go down because now they're actually extracting funds out of the Salute Commons. But what we do is we create an uh, exit tribute. You can almost think of our, our tributes, we, we call them tributes. You can almost think of them as like taxes uh, for the economy. This is where, what funds the funding pool. So when people decide to leave the commons, it hurts the commons. You're, you're taking value out of the commons and maybe, but maybe there's another commons that you think is doing a better job. Salute commons isn't doing a great job for uh, public health in general. You'd rather see a, a, a COVID-19 like anti-fake news commons uh, and you wanna support that. So you burn your salute commons tokens and you take your money back and you can then send it to the other thing. But when this happens, the, now the crowd, the people who are in this community are leaving. The price can represent this, this fact, the fact that people don't have as much faith in the Salute Commons as they used to. So the price goes down when the tokens are destroyed. But now this is just, again, this is, oh no, that's not good. Uh, the, this is just when, uh, the, this is just our default system, right? In the end, this is where CAD CAD comes in. You can build whatever commons you want. You can create whatever system you want. You can make the, you can, uh, instead of using the exit tribute, you can have an entry tribute. You can have, uh, people can donate directly and get tokens uh, uh, for, you know, that are, that can't be sold into the bonding curve, but give them voting power. So yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of, uh, design opportunities in this space. So now, how do people make decisions in the Salute Commons? Uh, I, I think I've uh, gone a little bit long, I'm a little behind, so I can't go into conviction voting as much as I'd like, but we have this governance system called conviction voting, where all the token holders basically go get to, like, whenever they want, they can go and pick their favorite public health projects. I mean, these people are supposed to be interested in public health anyway, right? So Let's trust their opinion and let's, let's hear what they think are the best projects to support to, for the use of these funds. And, uh, and then, and to make that really easy, we have uh, conviction voting where there's no time, there's no like time limits. People can come and vote whenever they want. And uh, if, they, if they don't vote very often, their opinion actually grows over time. So anyway, uh, conviction voting has a lot of details, but I have to keep going. Okay, how do we start one of these things? And this is really the crazy thing about bonding curves. If, if there's another thing that everyone needs to know about bonding curves, right? There's, there's two things. Uh, the second thing is that you want to be the first person to buy into a bonding curve. Because when you buy into the bonding curve at the beginning, 
you get a lot of tokens because at the beginning, in most bonding curves design, the price is really low. As the supply grows, the price goes up. So you, the people who put in money at, at the beginning will get more governance power in the commons than people who come in later. And so when we start one of these things, the, the, let's, we're, we're, we call them hatchers, the Salute Commons hatchers will pool their money and the money will be split between the reserve and the funding pool. And let's, so let's say that they raise a million dollars and let's say that 400K goes to the funding pool, 600K goes to the reserve. And we designed the token bonding curve such that it, at the, when 600K is in the reserve, the price of the token is actually 25 cents. So when the reserve has 600K, the price of the token is 25 cents. So now this is how we get to make magic internet money happen for, for the commons, okay? And I know this seems wild, but that hatchers put in 1 million, right? 400K goes to the funding pool, 600K goes to the reserve. It creates, a uh, we're gonna say that the hatchers bought in at a price of 10 cents. So let's say that 10 million tokens were created because they put in uh, 10, 10 cents euros, let's just say, right? And, and now they get $2.5 million worth of tokens left. Like what, how is this possible? This, is, this doesn't make any sense. Right? This is this is this doesn't work. Well, actually, this is how it works in our normal markets too. It's kind of crazy. But like uh, when when Amazon did their IPO, they created five hundred million dollars worth of Amazon shares, but they only sold ten percent of them. So they 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 collected fifty million dollars worth of money from from accredited investors and gave them $50 million worth of Amazon shares, and then created out of nothing, half a, half a billion dollars in Amazon shares. And this is a similar thing, but with us, it's transparent. It's clear because this is an example of a bonding curve that, that does this, right? Where uh, at the beginning, the tokens were really cheap. So they were buying really cheap tokens. And then at the end, the tokens were more expensive. They were 25 cents. And so the average price of all the tokens that they bought was 10 cents. This is generally called slippage. I also like to refer to the market cap illusion. The fact is that Jeff Bezos, when he made that sweetheart deal with uh, the SEC, and he made half a billion dollars worth of Amazon stock and, uh, and also got... $50 million from the public, right? So effectively Amazon had created, you know, uh, well, anyway, Jeff Bezos gave himself half of the tokens that were created, sorry, half of the shares that were created. Now this is a shit coin of all shit coins, right? Like the one guy gets 45% of all the tokens in existence. And now he's the richest man in the world, right? He's got $130 billion or something like that. Well, we all know that despite the fact that we say he's the richest man in the world or whatever, his $130 billion is not worth $130 billion. It's not. If he sold all of that stock right now on, on this exchange, I mean, you would see the market tank like no other, fall like a rock because there's not enough liquidity to buy all of his stock. So his $130 billion, maybe it's worth 10 billion. Who knows? We don't know how much it would be worth. With a bonding curve, this exact scenario also occurs, but it's transparent. We know, and these hatchers know, that they have on Etherscan, it says they have $2.5 million worth of tokens, but they know that there's only 600K backing them. They are fully aware that their $2.5 million worth of tokens is worth 600K because it's transparent. Unlike Jeff Bezos, we know exactly what would happen if they sold all their tokens. And this is why it's so important that when we do any kind of cryptocurrency stuff, any, any kind of digital asset, financial assets that we include vesting, vesting is really important. 
it's, vesting is really important because otherwise these hatchers have misaligned incentives. They will have a race to exit. They will be like, oh my God, there's only 600K back in our 2.5 million. I need to sell now, right? We have to make it so that they can't sell, so that they're incentivized to make good decisions. Oh, we'll get there in a second. So they're incentivized to make good decisions with this 400K that will bring in, in the funding pool, that will bring more people into the community and make them trust that these hatchers are altruistically minded and that they're in it for the public good. And now these hatchers will be also rewarded when they succeed at providing the public good because more people will come in and the token price at 25 cents will actually rise as more people donate uh, to the uh, Salute Commons. So let's build a, a, a more specific Commons. Let's talk about how we would start one of these things because you know the Salute Commons was kind of a general public health Commons and I think that's bullshit. I don't think those things will work very well if it's too broad, if it's this whole global thing that has such a wide scope like public health. I, I don't know that it would succeed. I think it's more, I think it's way easier to have a specific goal in mind. And so let's talk about creating uh, COVID-19 open research commons. So the COVID-19 open research commons or CORC, that's what I'll call it. Its goal is to spread knowledge about um, COVID-19 research, right? Like all around the world, making, making the knowledge accessible for everyone. There's a lot of fake news out there. We don't know who to trust and everything's moving so fast. It would be so nice if we had people who were incentivized appropriately to instead of making fake news and clickbait that uh, they would actually create trusted uh, information and curate trusted information that uh, in real time that people can, you know, believe in. And so uh, their goals, their, their first goals are just to call out fake news, especially from official sources, right? Uh, they, their goal is to take research around the world and publish it in multiple languages, especially in China. There's so much information in China and none of us have access to it. It's, 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 uh, it's very difficult to reach, but if we had a trusted uh, third party that was international and not, not political, then maybe we could uh, trust it. And so that's, that's kind of its first efforts. And if it grows really big, then it can add a few more. Maybe it can also uh, fund open research studies like experimental research that seems promising or even create an immunity ledger to track immunity. Uh, so, you know, if we know who's immune, then maybe they can go out and, and work jobs and not everyone has to be uh, quarantined if there's some people immune. You know, th there's, there's other ideas that they could cr come up with but it's really important to just nail down like some small things and start with a, a core piece. And, and when starting these things, you generally aren't going to start decentralized fully from the beginning. So we always wanna have a community steward. One thing that I've seen from DAOs that have been successful in, in our space is that like MakerDAO has Rich Brown and he does an amazing job at managing the community. Uh, and, and he's almost invisible, right? Uh, Amin, very much more visible for Moloch, but he made Moloch a success. It wouldn't have worked without Amin. And I'm gonna use the example of Peter Pan because Peter Pan is probably, is another one of my favorite uh, community stewards uh, for Meta Cartel, but this is, this, is a, this is a more exciting picture of him. So, and this is a different Peter Pan. This, this Peter Pan, is more of an expert on fake news and research. So uh, Peter Pan cannot be the only person in the commons. It's really important when we're starting these things that we collect people who are aligned with the value of the, that the network proposes to create, right? Uh, and this is true for all decentralized networks. This isn't something just for commons. This is for every blockchain that exists every coin that exists. If you have uh, a bunch of people who are like, hey, I got an idea, let's create, uh, I, we can make a lot of money if we create a sharing economy website or something like that. And, and maybe we can like, you know, get a bunch of people to buy into our ICO and then we'll be rich. If, that, if that's the idea, 
then it's a shit coin. Okay. It's not going to work. The people who started it, the people who have all the power, they're going to bail and dump the coin because that's how they make the most money. If the purpose is to make money, decentralized networks don't work. If your purpose is a, a little bit higher than that, and the people uh, is much higher than that, and the people who are uh, starting this and have power in the organization, especially in the beginning, uh, believe in that, then your decentralized network would succeed. In Bitcoin, it was Satoshi and the early devs who were very like cypherpunk oriented and they wanted to see the end, uh, they wanted to see a, a free currency. Or maybe in Ethereum, the Ethereum Foundation, Vitalik and, and these guys, they're not in it for the money. The money is nice, it makes it possible to dive in, but the real thing that they care about is creating actual value for society. And it's the same for the COVID-19 Open Research Commons for Cork. They need, it needs to be made up of expert researchers, probably researchers from the medical field, researchers that uh, can do good work and like find good resources and also fact check them quickly, right? And know, know what, what is right or wrong. And ideally they would be internationally respected and have a rep reputation of being politically neutral and altruistic. So this is Peter Pan's first job. He's got to find these people. The commons, the cork commons, the cork will not start without a trusted seed. And, the, and uh, what we want to do to make it easy, because like maybe these researchers that come in, they may not really know how to work with MetaMask and how token bonding curves work. So while Peter Pan needs to go find all those researchers that are superstars that know how to uh, find good information and, and curate good information, they might also want to bring in the common stack trusted seed. So this, and this is why, uh, this is what we're working on right now in the common stack is to build a large group of people who can be trusted to be altruistic and can become experts in common management. So uh, this is what we're working on right now. We're trying to build out our trusted seed. We need to make sure that they are value driven, not profit driven. And we need kind of a large group because like the COVID-19 commons, there might only be a few people in crypto, maybe 10 people in all of crypto that care, that have some kind of background in this that would be beneficial and or even have interest in this commons. So we need a, div, a, a large group of people with diverse interests to create this, uh, tr this common stack trusted seed. And in return for being part of the trusted seed, the, the C stack token holders, that's how we manage the trusted seed, uh, they can actually hatch commons. So they can, um, they'll be part of this group that other commons, when they wanna hatch, they'll look to and be like, oh yeah, we need some token engineering expertise. We need some like blockchain people in our commons that, that have done this before. So that's where C stack token holders come in. They can just say, oh yeah, uh, you know, 2% of our hatch goes to C-Stack token holders. They can buy in. And then uh, the trusted seed also will have governance rights in the common stack and will decide what commons we work with and this sort of thing. So uh, this is now time for a commercial break because there is some crazy stuff going on. Uh, if, if you want to be part of the common stack, uh, trusted seed, the best thing you can do is donate to our uh, Gitcoin grants. So Gitcoin is running a promotion where if you, it's not really a promotion, uh, the Ethereum Foundation and a few other people donated 250K to get, to distribute to uh, projects on Gitcoin. And uh, the common stack actually has about seven projects that it's affiliated with, that if you donate one die to these projects, they will receive some of them upwards of 400 die, right? Uh, I, I, we saw Will Ruddick and uh, we have two, uh, pro, we have two Gitcoin grants with the grassroots economics. There's the commons dashboard prototype, which is, uh, which is by multiply. Dot, and, then, and then we have the full on grassroots economics campaign, which Will runs. And we have a few others. There's Give It 2.0, which is basically a DAO to fight COVID-19. And it's a Reddit-style upvote DAO, kind of, kind of like conviction voting in a way. Uh, and it's an early prototype of Give It 2.0. And of course, CADCAD, 
uh, another great Gitcoin grant. If anyone donates over a hundred DAI to, to uh, the Common Stack Iteration Zero or the Common Simulator Gitcoin grant, then you will be rewarded with CStack tokens and you will be able to prove that you're altruistic. And so we should probably trust you to be part of our trusted seed. And so you will receive CStack tokens. Anyway, back to our scheduled programming. Uh, we, uh, once you have the trusted seed locked down, once you figure out who you want to trust to hatch your commons, then you need to actually uh, create a mission statement, right? Notice we have not launched a DAO yet. There's no smart contracts here. This is the cultural build. It's very important. It might take months, it could even take a year of discussing with how this is not, yeah, I'm sorry, COVID-19 open research commons might be difficult to launch in the time that we need it, unfortunately. But uh, this is because it's really important to align everyone who participates in this, in, in this commons a lot around a mission statement, around values, legal strategies, policies, procedures. It, we need to create, fall, look to the research that we've seen out in, in the world around building communities. And Os Eleanor Ostrom, uh, she wrote eight principles, which I really hope everyone will just check out. It's eight sentences. It's so worth it. Uh, Michelle Balance, who uh, actually spoke in my slot earlier, I'm so honored uh, that I could give up my spot so he could speak. Uh, he's another amazing researcher who has done a, a lot of things around uh, how to build peer-to-peer -peer communities. Uh, flat, there's, there's a lot of research out there outside of blockchain space, and there's a lot of researcher, research from inside that blockchain space. I mean, look at what happened with Steve and, uh, Steam and Hive right now. That is worth studying. There's a lot of interesting things going on around how communities work with decentralized systems. So, not only do you need to get your act together, you need to follow Eleanor Ostrom's eight principles, but because now we're adding in this extra, this extra weirdness of this being on a blockchain, we need to also look at um, the successes and failures in the DAO space. So once you've done your cultural build, you have the people, you have the plan, that's when you start launching the the actual project, right? And part of making the plan is also determining, uh, which I should add in here, is, is doing the CAD-CAD simulations so that you can uh, parameterize your commons and, and actually make your commons specifically for the people who are going to be involved. Because CAD-CAD allows you to make agent-based simulation, simulations. And if you know the core group, the trusted seed, the, the people who are going to hatch your commons, people who are going to provide initial capital and have a lot of governance power in your commons, then you, you can do really nice agent-based simulations. And you can try to see, try to guess how people will react to uh, the price going up, price going down. And if you can design your system in a simulation environment, you can run 10 million simulations, look at the worst outcomes and then add in extra features to avoid those worst outcomes from being so bad. And this is the power of simulation tools. This is token engineering. And this is why Angela's work, Sebnem's work, Will's work, obviously Michael Zargum and Block Science's work is so critical for uh, you know, building the future economies of this world. But once you have done all of that work, then you can start deploying smart contracts and you can, and the trusted seed, the group of hatchers can start contributing funds. And then we can go into what I described earlier with the salute commons, where there's a hatch, there's vesting, and there's starting to be real work being done. So of course, you know, the COVID-19 commons will not work right now. MetaMask is really annoying. Uh, we don't have the, the crypto UX nailed down yet. So, that's why the common stack is really focused on the commons within the blockchain space. Specifically, token engineering commons is going to be the first commons we want to launch. Once we have our trusted seed built, uh, we will start building the token engineering commons. And we want to iteratively deploy, uh, iteratively develop four more field test commons, one field test commons for each core piece 
of the common stack, um, uh, common stack, I don't know, our plan, our, our models, right? And then each time we develop one of these field tests, we'll iterate on every piece, right? We'll improve the models, we'll improve the UX, improve the cultural and technical playbooks. So right now, we're building our trusted seed. We're looking for experts in digital governance uh, or decentralized governance or digital governance, honestly, um, and token engineering. And we hope to train them to be, uh, we really just hope that they'll participate in some commons and have uh, kind of a, 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 an idea of how commons work. And if you want to be part of our trusted seed, please go to commonstack.org slash apply. And, or of course, you can donate to our Gitcoin grants. One die in most of these grants will get at least $50 for all of the people. Uh, please consider going on Gitcoin and donating. It's a, it's a huge opportunity to, sh to funnel money to the projects that you care about. So even if you don't donate to ours, it's, that's fine. Just go out there and donate to other projects and feel, feel empowered to move some of the Ethereum Foundation's money to, a good, to a good causes. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, and also I have all these links to stuff you can learn more about. I tweeted about uh, I tweeted about the uh, the um, these slides. So all of these links are accessible. I will also post the slides in the Discord chat. So that's it. Amazing! Uh, Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> yeah, um, we have exactly ten minutes for a Q and A session. Um, would anyone like to raise a hand? Yeah, I see a hand from Grace. Grace, you've made some comments in the Discord chat, but I think it's it's much easier if you just um, uh, speak up here. Yeah, the comments were comments. This is actually a question. Um, so I, I first of all, I love I love it. It's really the explanation is very very clear and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it is it is crazy, but it's not crazier than the current types of markets that we have and it's that model works my concern is about growth right one of the problems that we have in our current economy is that because everything is based on future value right so this stock issuing that you were talking about with jeff bezos it's based on your company needs to grow right so your seed starts and then your bonding curve is based on the fact that your nonprofit will grow and what that's caused is kind of like a it's a little bit of a of a situation where our economy always needs to grow at the expense of all kinds of things, usually our happiness, because we're so growth, 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 growth. And right now, when everything is stopped, even though fundamentally there is enough food for people and enough shelter for people, because the financial system is based on the need for growth, um, we find ourselves facing potential financial crisis. And so I'm concerned about creating nonprofits that will be based on the same fragile um, kind of curve. Can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the end, it's all about scope. Now, I, I believe, I agree that the, the growth complex is an issue in our current society and our, our current models. It, it doesn't necessarily allow for things to die. And sometimes, projects can be short-lived and they should be allowed to die. It shouldn't be this thing that a project has to have a forever complex. The problem is that, well, this is what we know. And so, you know, within the first models of the common stack, uh, we just have to work with what we have. And what we have to avoid scope creep and, and being too idealistic about being able to create the right answers ourselves, uh, we're going, we are trying to do our best to work with what we have and the models that we know work. Uh, I, I do think that there is an advantage in this system that we are not relying on, we are creating our own economy. And when you create your own economy, you're creating your own like uh, currency and the, the story of that currency can be different, right? Now, the story of every stock is we need to make investors money. To do that, we do X, right? That's the story of every stock that exists. Uh, the story of, every, of a commons will be, we need to make value for our community. 
right? If, if your commons goal is to save the Amazon, right? And you know that when you contribute to the commons and that commons gets bigger, then they will be able to have economics of scale to actually save the Amazon, which is a problem. So th then you can be, feel kind of better about becoming a save the Amazon commons token maximalist, right? I only work for save the Amazon commons tokens because if this economy grows, then it'll be easier to protect that the lungs of our world, you know? So uh, I, in when it's really about the story of the money, the story of the currency and the story of the financial asset. And if it's really a story that you believe in, that you want to become a maximalist in, it's okay for it to have. I, I, I predict, I can only theorize. I, I also have concerns, but it may, I, I think it'll be, I don't think we'll see the same results as we see in our current economic system. Okay, uh, thank you. Another fellow spacer has raised a hand, Anonymous. Could you maybe speak up? So I see Thomas has raised a hand, but also another person beat you to it, but the person is not talking now, so Thomas, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Griff. Hi, Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, Thank you for having me. In that, that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So, uh, yeah, we, we should talk about it at some time. Um, another, uh, another question. So basically, when you do the hatch phase, and uh, when you need to get this kind of momentum that basically uh, you get enough uh, funds into, into, uh, into the pools, um, what's, what do you think is all needed uh, to, to get enough momentum? Because basically it's, uh, if you say the commons of, let's say, uh, saving the Amazon or other kind of big commons, uh, I mean, getting that kind of momentum by itself and then kind of getting them all towards uh, funding into a token bonding curve and then basically getting them tokens, managing those tokens, that's kind of a kind of a big leap, uh, getting people uh, to do that in something so alien what we are building here, don't yeah. you think? Uh, I completely agree. And that's why uh, I don't want to start with saving the Amazon. I, it'll be a lot easier if I can go to all the experts that know, because it's really important that you don't let investors into your hatch. You really want the experts, because these are the people that are going to be making decisions about how to spend money in the funding pool uh, early on and probably for the life of the commons. They're going to have a lot of tokens, and so they're going to have a lot of governance power in how you decide that your organization goes about saving the Amazon. So, but the, the problem is of course that these guys, that are they gonna trust that this system could work? No, man, come on, they're, they're busy saving the Amazon. It, we, I, I don't think that this can work for them right now. I think that we need to be able to point to token engineering commons, F2.0 commons, the, you know, the, these other blockchain centric commons that have a proven track record of uh, the hatchers being rewarded, the, basically creating a win-win system where the values and mission statement of the nonprofit organization, the commons, is achieved and everybody actually made money by doing it. I know that sounds like almost antithetical, but it's how it should be. If these commons are creating value for society, they should be rewarded. And that's, that's the goal of the common stack. And so we, we first need to start with people who will understand and will be able to trust this. I think token engineers are the first, first people. And once we have a few examples in, in, the, in the nonprofit software space and blockchain space, then we can start expanding to real world issues. Thank you. Uh, I saw another one raise their hand. Someone keeps raising their hand and then putting him back, back down. Would hey. anyone like to speak? Are you a spammer? Come on, <laughs> pull yourself. I oh. don't see a hand anymore, but uh, we have some 
a couple of questions in the in the Discord chat. So the first one was, uh, I wonder if it's possible to get enough market data, for example, for stocks for calculating where the current price would be on a bonding curve. Uh, well, the problem is that there's a lot of details in how you design the bonding curve, right? You, if you design a bonding curve and you, uh, you know, you um, take all the buys and sell data that exists, you could maybe a little bit, you could probably like back calculate a bonding curve that would fit maybe the initial buys and sells. And then maybe you could extrapolate that on. Uh, but it would be, that would be, that'd be an interesting project. I don't, I don't know. You'd have to talk to Zargum if that's even really reasonable or possible, or if it would produce data that would be valuable. I, I honestly don't think it would because so much of the design of the bonding curve is uh, done in advance and needs to be done in advance. Oh, C is here. Oh yeah, because he's the next speaker. Um, so uh, yeah, the bonding curve itself is the economic estimator. So it, it's, it's hard to use data for a stock and apply it to a bonding curve. I, I, I saw another quote. I, I, does that answer the question? I don't have much time left. Um, yeah, let's hope so. We have a, a minute I, left. So I, maybe if you I have talk. a I have a, a question that I want to address that I saw Grace put in the chat. Uh, yeah. The problem with the trusted seed is that power corrupts. I'm trustworthy now, but if I become trusted with $15 million or a standing army, it's not clear what would happen. Uh, and, and so, like how do we basically i would say how do we deal with that so with the common stack trusted seed we actually are managing the trusted seed this is a reputation token and uh we are if people start behaving inappropriately we will take we will actually burn their c stack tokens well but honestly we believe that just the threat of being able to burn c stack tokens will keep people uh honest and make keep them behaving um, however, wait, wait, we who, will have a process. We? Like, who, who's we? What? Are you? Is it the who are the we that are going to burn this? This would be the Common Stack Association, and we have already burned a few tokens. Uh, like one person lost their keys, and so we burned their C Stack tokens and moved and created new tokens for them because it's really about managing a community and managing a trusted community. And one of Eleanor Ostrom's principles is monitoring. And, and we need to monitor this community to make sure that they can, that they will, uh, and, and apply graduated sanctions uh, to people who break the values of the community. So while tokens in a, in, in a commons are immutable, common stack org can't touch them. You, you know, we, that's, that's something else. So when you hatch a commons, that's a different token, but, uh, as far as C stack tokens and our trust, our trusted seed in the common stack, this is something that we are curating. So uh, people who donate, you know, they have more skin in the game. They have more, they have more at stake in the common stack success. So we can trust them with more C stack tokens. Uh, people who are contributing to the common stack, we do a praise, uh, a monthly praise reward. So if you do something and we praise you in the main channel, then you're likely to receive common stack tokens because you have skin in the game. You've been doing these things for the common stack org. So we believe you will uphold, there's a like, better likelihood of you upholding the values of the common stack. 